Stephen, you're standing in front of a relatively old map. Uh, tell us a little bit about this and what the Neptune was designed to correct. Well, this is a map from the late 1740s by John Thornton, and it shows northeastern North America. And I think you can see, just by glancing at it, that it doesn't look much like a modern map at all. We have lines of latitude on here, but we don't have longitude. And so the geography of the area shown on the map is somewhat uh, distorted. Uh, and to understand the revolution brought about by the Atlantic Neptune and the surveys that led up to the Atlantic, Atlantic Neptune, you've got to see this map of the, the 1740s. And then when you see what the surveyors did for the Atlantic Neptune, you get an understanding of the great revolution in surveying and mapping that took place in the 1760s and 1770s. Stephen, we're standing in front of a map from the Neptune. Now tell us how this compares to the one we just saw. Well, this is one of the most magnificent charts from the Atlantic Neptune, dates to about 1780. And uh, as you see, it covers the same geographic area as we saw in the Thornton map. But you can immediately recognize that this looks like a modern map. We don't have that great distortion of geography that we saw in the Thornton map. The revolution that's occurred here is that not only do we have accurate reading of latitude, but we now also have reading for longitude. Um, and this was done through using telescopes and comparing observations here in northeastern North America uh, with observations back in London, which allowed the establishment of longitude. And so we could get the east-west distance uh, correct on this map, as well as the north-south uh, distance, and that allows the geographical shapes to look as they should should do to us today. And so I think this is an instantly recognizable part of northeastern North America, whereas the Thornton map, uh, you can see that it was uh, somewhat distorted. And talk about the, the genesis of the Neptune. How did it start? Was it a commission? Uh, how did it begin and who paid for it? Uh, it's quite a long process in the development of the, uh, the Neptune. It began uh, in the early 1760s during the Seven Years' War. The British uh, were fighting the French in uh, northeastern North America. And after they captured Quebec, they realized they needed uh, accurate maps of the St. Lawrence Valley. Uh, and they did a great survey of the St. Lawrence. And then after the peace treaty in 1763, when they took over former French and Spanish territory and then controlled the territory from Hudson Bay down to the Gulf of Mexico and from the eastern seaboard to uh, the Mississippi River, they realized they needed maps of these vast areas that were now under British control. And so surveys were instituted from Labrador uh, and Newfoundland right down to the Gulf of Mexico to figure out what they now had Let's talk a little bit about the people who made the Neptune. There were two uh, principal characters. Uh, one was Samuel Holland. The other was Joseph Frederick Wallet de Bar. And we're looking at a uh, reproduction of a painting of de Bar here. Uh, they were both army officers. They were both from the continent of Europe. Samuel Holland was from the Netherlands. Uh, de Bar was from Switzerland. The outbreak of the Seven Years' War, Britain was short of army engineers and surveyors, and so they recruited actively on the European continent and brought these two uh, surveyors into the Royal American Regiment, and they were promptly shipped out to North America to uh, begin the survey and mapping work. Uh, Holland was the more senior officer, and uh, Debar his junior. They had divided responsibilities for the surveys. Holland did most of the surveying work from Quebec round to Newport, Rhode Island. Debar um, did Nova Scotia, surveyed Nova Scotia. We know more about Debar because it's Debar who gets the, that gets the charts uh, published, engraved and published in London. And so Debar's name is on the Atlantic Neptune rather than Samuel Holland. Stephen, the charts in the Neptune were not just used for scientific purposes. There was 
economic and military uh, uses for them as well. Talk about that for a bit. Uh, that's, that's correct. We're looking at a map here of Egmont Harbor on the coast of Nova Scotia. And this is one of Debar's surveys. He did uh, Nova Scotia. He was working for the Admiralty. So he was most concerned about uh, providing accurate charts of harbors and potential harbors along the coast of Nova Scotia. And also identifying areas that could be used for the fishery, uh, particularly the cod fishery, which is, as you know, so important in the Gulf of Maine and the coast of uh, Nova Scotia. So this wonderful chart is showing several important pieces of information for a mariner. Not only do we have the very careful delineation of the coastline, but we also have soundings so a mariner would know the depth of water. And at the bottom of the chart, you can see a coastal profile that's been incorporated into this particular plate from the Atlantic Neptune. So if you're at sea, a mariner could see uh, the headlands and identify uh, where he was along the coast. So th this particular map from the uh, Atlantic Neptune uh, shows these different types of information which will be of use to a naval officer or indeed a commercial mariner working along the coast. Uh, this map also has this charming vignette in the center of the map and it's showing a settler's clearing and a log cabin and gives some sense of the beginnings of uh, European settlement uh, along this coast and uh, it has no uh, really geographic or military information, but it is just in sort of enlivening the chart and adding a sort of human dimension to the overall image. And this chart isn't black and white, but uh, some of them are color, and those were hand colored? Yes, these were, would have been uh, colored with a hand wash, and so you can get various shades of green or indeed brown that would be applied to the, uh, the land areas. Talk a little bit about the process from going from the original sketches that they made in the field to getting it printed in the, in the Neptune. Well, when both surveyors went back to London at the, just before the outbreak of the American Revolution, they took back uh, their manuscript maps, which were very detailed. These were more than just sketches. They were extremely detailed and large-scale maps. And Samuel Holland gave his maps over to Debar and Debar began the laborious process of turning a manuscript map into an engraved chart. And we're very fortunate to have one of the copper plates on display here at the exhibition. It's been lent by the Massachusetts Historical Society and shows this large engraved plate that would have been used in the press to print uh, the, the map. This particular plate is showing Falmouth, so it's of direct local interest. Falmouth, of course, was the uh, predecessor of modern Portland. The plate itself is showing the last state of engraving. They would have begun with quite a basic outline of the coastline. And as they got more information, particularly soundings, they added information. So there are several states to these charts. I think on display here we have two states from uh, the Falmouth chart, but other parts of the coast went through even more uh, states. Uh, as they got more information, it was applied to the copper plate. And so what we're seeing here with this copper plate is the very final uh, addition or the final state uh, of the plate and all the information they amassed and put on the plate at that time. Stephen, we've talked about the detail in these charts and maps. We're standing in front of one of, of the main coast. To talk about the detail that's shown here. If you were to look at the earlier charts, such as the Thornton map, uh, the main coast really defeated those map makers. And on the main coast, particularly Casco Bay, with its very complex geography of peninsulas and islands and reefs and islets and so forth. And so it was very crudely represented on the earlier maps. And when the surveyors, and this is actually Holland and his deputy surveyors, came into the Gulf of Maine, they were headquartered in Portsmouth and spent several years surveying the Maine coast. And the reason it took them so long, of course, is the complexity of the coast. They couldn't just leave bits out or represent it crudely. They were very aware that they were producing a scientific hydrographic chart. And so they were meticulous 
in what they were recording on, on the maps and charts. And we can see this in the spectacular example of, of Casco Bay. This is a chart that actually belongs to the OSHA map uh, library and we're very fortunate to have it here in Portland showing, of course, Casco Bay, Falmouth uh, and so forth. Does a chart or a map with this detail sort of change the, the, the people at the time, change their view of the world? Mm -hmm. These maps were being produced during the American Revolution. They started to be printed in 1775, 1776. And so it's unlikely that the local people would have seen these charts. These were in the hands of the naval, the Royal Naval officers who were uh, imposing a blockade on the New England coast. And the last thing they wanted was the Patriots to get their hands on this latest scientific uh, knowledge of the, uh, of the rebellious coast. So it was something that's highly classified then? Yes, it certainly was. Uh, there is a remarkable story in that one of the, uh, the naval officers working for Day Bar, charting the Gulf of Maine, uh, was unaware that the revolution had broken out. And he put into Machias Harbor to wood and water, take on supplies, essentially. And he was captured by the, the Patriots. It's a very well-known uh, incident in, in the beginnings of the American Revolution. So he was imprisoned. And he took all his personal belongings and maps with him. And then he was exchanged for an American prisoner and came back to the British side with all his maps with him. And there's a wonderful letter from one of the Patriots leaders in Machaya saying, oh gosh, you know, we've, we've let him go back with all those charts and we should have really kept the charts. So it was only after the fact they realized that he had all this scientific information with him, which he then brought back to the British side. The charts in the exhibition are over 200 years old. Do they still have value today? They most certainly do. They're used by geologists, by archeologists, and indeed by geographers. The geologists find them of great use because they provide our first baseline data for the coastline and uh, the sea level at that time in the 1760s and early 1770s. They're very scientifically uh, accurate and so we can now measure how the land surface or the sea has changed uh, from that period over the past 250 years. Archaeologists use these maps because uh, they often show some human information along the coast. There'll be some settlement information and archaeologists have used the maps to find the foundations or indeed uh, existing houses from that period. They're shown on the charts and so they're in a sense a guide for the archaeologists looking for settlement along the coast. And geographers such as Rosemary Mosier have used them to reconstruct what Portland looked like uh, 250 years ago. This particular uh, creation is showing uh, Debar's chart of uh, Falmouth overlaying over a modern aerial photograph. And so we can see the outline of the Portland Neck or Falmouth Neck and the coastline as it was 250 years ago. And then the modern infill in Portland Harbor and in the Back Bay area. And the exhibit is here in the Ocean Map Library uh, for how long? It's here until August 14th. And it is well worth a visit. It's uh, a magnificent uh, display of maps and there's a number of very fine uh, main maps on show. It's as good as an exhibition of the Atlantic Neptune that I've seen. Mm -hmm.